Welcome to chapter four, key issue two. We're talking about folk culture still. Where are folk and popular culture distributed? Folk and pop culture. As far as clothing, we've got folk clothing where it's created because it fits in with how they live. It's used for agricultural practices and environmental conditions because people throughout history had to grow their populations based on the materials they had in the physical environments where they were located. Consider specific examples of the Netherlands where they wear wooden shoes. Netherlands is a historically low-lying area where they've actually built land that's below sea level and they have uh, dikes and levees that hold the sea water back, but it, it's definitely it floods a lot. Um, it's low lying, so any water they get there is going to cover a lot of ground. So they traditionally wear wooden shoes so they can keep their feet dry because you're not going to want to wear canvas or tennis shoes because they're going to be soaking wet. Of course, you go up to where it's cold in the Arctic, they're wearing fur lined boots. Maybe if you're in a warm climate on the beaches or in the tropics, you're not wearing shoes at all. This folk clothing, the thing about it is, it can seem to be kind of controversial if you're wearing your folk garb in popular culture. You know, today in society, when you're walking down the street in the United States, everybody is wearing jeans, t-shirt, um, tennis shoes. But if you maybe want to honor your culture and you wear some of that clothing, like what if this guy walked down the street in the United States with his wooden shoes, people would really find him out of place. And so it becomes tough to um, honor your folk clothing traditions. Pop clothing, on the other hand, it's reflective of your occupations. Um, if you are uh, in business in the United States or the Western society, you're going to be wearing the Western business suit. Suit, tie for men, uh, nice dress and slacks for women perhaps. Pop clothing can be based on income. Of course, everybody... Well, lots of people wanted Air Jordan shoes, high tops. When I was growing up, it was ridiculous. That's, that's when they first came out in the, in the 1980s and 90s. And if, if you couldn't afford a, the, those kind of shoes, which I couldn't, um, then you're not going to be able to get that clothing because popular culture is sold for a profit, and it can be high dollar. So if you can't afford it, then your income limits you. Pop clothing is spread rapidly through global communication. Nowadays, we can take a picture of something on our phone and send it on the internet and everybody sees it across the globe. So something that's popular is going to sp spread very, very fast as opposed to traditional garb like wooden shoes because it's not made for the masses. It's made for individuals in certain specific unique locations. Pop clothing is created for the masses. They make it so it catches on and it sells to a whole bunch of people. Folk food preferences. Why do folk cultures eat certain foods? You know, when you go to a certain location, why do they have very specific, unique foods? Well, a lot of the times it's affected by what's available, and it's influenced by cultural traditions. Some examples. The Abipone of Paraguay, they eat jaguars, stags, and bulls to make them strong, brave, and swift. This is what they think. But hens or tortoises will make them cowardly. So you, you wonder, why do the Abipone um, of Paraguay eat these things? Well... Because over the course of time, they saw people eating jaguars and stags and bulls, and maybe they had a great performance. They seemed stronger. Um, they were able to hunt more, and so they thought, okay, well, these things are what make them strong. Um, and then as far as hens and tortoises, maybe somebody over the course of time, they ate, a, they ate a tortoise, a turtle, and it just made them kind of weak and cowardly. So that's how these things get started. The Ainu of Japan avoid otter because they are forgetful. That makes sense, right? If you look at an otter that maybe seems like they don't know what they're doing. Hey, maybe we avoid that. Or someone ate otter, and then down the line that person became forgetful. Makes sense that maybe they're going to avoid that certain type of food. The Mkapao women don't eat chicken or goat during pregnancy because they believe it reduces labor pain. So somewhere down the line, people ate chicken and goat maybe before uh, giving birth and had a horrible, horrible time. So they're like, okay, what was the problem? Well, you know, she did eat chicken and goat before she gave birth, so she had a horrible time, so I'm going to avoid that. The Istanbul diet is full of fresh ve vegetables because the city has many small gardens called Boston's, and you can see that reflected here. So if you go to Istanbul and you're like, wow, why don't they have cheeseburgers and french fries all over the place? Why does do they eat um, 
fresh vegetables in Istanbul? Well, over the course of their history, they planted small gardens all throughout their city to sustain themselves. Because when the city came under attack, if they had gardens outside the city walls, of course they couldn't get food. So to combat this, they just grew those gardens in small plots inside the city. So they could still raise food even while they were under attack. So this is why that developed. This is why that remains part of their diet to this day. Taboos. A restriction on behavior imposed by social custom. Something they think of as bad. Ooh, that's taboo. Well, the Hebrews are prohibited from eating animals that do not chew their cud or have cloven feet and fish lacking fins or scales. So they're not going to eat, what, pigs? Muslims don't eat pork because perhaps they are not suited for dry lands in the Arabian Peninsula and would compete for water. Now this is a, a Rubenstein text um, thought process here. Why do Muslims eat pork? Well, it's against their religion. Um, one of the thoughts maybe is because they compete for water in dry lands and pigs don't really fit well. That's just Rubenstein's thought there. Uh, Hindus don't eat cows because they're based on sacred tradition of reincarnation and they think that if you die, you are reincarnated and one of the things you can become is a cow. And so they don't want to eat someone who could have been in another life, their friend or family member, so they're not going to eat cows. So these things are seen as taboos. Popular food culture. These pop food preferences are influenced mostly by cultural values. So we look at the differences among countries here. So which country prefers more of Coca-Cola or which prefers Pepsi? Well, in the Western Hemisphere, except for Quebec, uh, Coca-Cola leads. But in Quebec, Pepsi leads because they successfully had a lot of propaganda, uh, commercials, and promotions that said that French Canadian culture really tied in well to Pepsi. So Pepsi leads in Quebec over here, whereas other places it's Coke. Soviet Russia had Pepsi, but with the fall of communism, they switched to Coke to get away to the, with the association of failed government. But also it's because when it was communist in Soviet Russia over here, and they were using Pepsi, they would see in a limited basis. U.S. kids on the limited amounts of television they had, where they had access to back then, U.S. youth being free and driving around in convertibles um, and cars and they could do whatever they want. They were wearing jeans and drinking Coke. These guys were drinking Pepsi. So when the wall fell and Russia became more of a democracy, they switched over to Coke because they wanted a new statement. They wanted to f feel what they thought of was freedom in the United States. The Muslim countries in Southwest Asia they have boycotted Coke because it was sold in Israel, which it, they're always in competition with. So Pepsi is preferred in these Southwest Asian Muslim countries. Then we look at regional differences within the United States. Dunkin' Donuts they like in the Northeast as opposed to Krispy Kreme in the Southwest. White Castle up in the Midwest or In-N-Out Burger in the Southwest. I think we have In-N-Out Burger here in uh, Texas. But growing up, we had White Castle over here. We didn't have anything like in and out Burger. Wine is preferred in California because they have the best grapes there. But in the Midwest, we've got beer and spirits because so much grain is grown in this area, and that's what you use to make beer and things like vodka and whiskey. Pork rinds in the South is preferred because that's where they have a bunch of uh, pig farms. And popcorn and potato chips in the north because they have those kind of grains. Now that to me sounds a little bit of overboard assumptions there and, G and, and things in general. But, I mean, Rubenstein does a good job of trying to reason and, and group things together so that's easier for us to grasp. Wine production. Well, there's environmental factors that go into it. Number one is the climate. Temperate climates with modern winter and, hold and uh, hot sunny summer tend to be the best places to grow wine. So if you're looking for where that might be, of course, we're looking over here in um, the temperate Mediterranean climate, of course, and over in California. The topography for growing wine it usually is best when you have hillsides that maximize sunlight exposure, but also you can drain it well. So in hilly California, that's perfect as well. As opposed, to, I mean, at the same time with the Medi Mediterranean. Then, of course, soil. Soil that is coarse and well-drained is great for growing grapes, but also cultural factors. Wine seems to be grown in locations with traditions of excellence, where people like to drink it and where people can afford it. Where do you find that? 
in wine country, and in Napa Valley. And it's you really dominated by Christian countries, and you don't really find great wine growing where it's discouraged by Hindu and Muslim countries because they don't drink wine in these areas, right? Folk housing, environmental influences. Why did they create these houses? Why do they look the way they do? Well, pitched roofs become pretty important in areas that are super rainy or snowy because you want it to be able to come off of your roof. You don't want a flat roof because that would just sit there and catch water and pile up on the snow and then it would collapse. Environmental influences, windows. Maybe we want them to face the sun so we can get some heat in there. Or, you know what, if we're in Texas, maybe we don't want our windows to face the sun because then it stays hot inside all day long. Wood. If our house has wood on it, it's probably because we could easily access lots of timber, lots of trees. If our house has brick, we probably don't have a, a lot of wood around. There's not very many trees, so we use the brick or the clay from what's available in the dirt right there, baking it in the hot sun in dry climates. Stone was common in Europe and in South America because they're, it's easily accessible in formats that they're not having to carve out. We get specific here. In Chinese villages, we're looking at folk housing. Kashgar, this type of, uh, this city, they utilize second floor, open air patios to catch evening breezes. And you can see that over here with the patios that are open to the breezes. In Turpan, you have small open courtyards for social gatherings. No second story patio because high winds. So you walk to the city in, in China called Turpan and you're like, I wonder why this house looks like this as opposed to in this city, the houses look like this. Well, we just told you. They want open air breezes here in Kashgar. And in Turpan, they, they want to be social with their open courtyards. We, we'd love to have a second story, but you know what? The winds are too high. In, in Chuan, they have large open air courtyards with tall trees for shade. So it's similar to Turpan, but a little bit different. And, and then in Dung Huan, they have walled courtyards covered with lattice to create shade, but they allow airflow as well. So these are just the regional differences based on the environmental influences. Sacred spaces and folk housing. Well, if you go to the island of Java, their front door always faces south because they're looking toward or welcoming the South Sea goddess who holds the key to the earth. And it sounds silly, but if you are one to ask the question, you know, why is every house facing south? Traditionally, that's why it developed like that. On the island of Fiji, the eastern wall is, con is considered sacred. So if you're wandering around in their house and you happen to lean up against it, you might want to be careful and keep that in mind. Why? Because it's sacred. In China, the northwestern wall is considered sacred in parts of China. Madagascar, you've got various things here. Well, the main door is always on the west. The northeastern corner is most sacred. If you're an important guest, you're going to enter from the north and be seated against the northern wall. And your bed is placed against the eastern wall with your head facing the north. Seems like a lot of guidelines. But these are folk traditions that are isolated. They're not created for the masses. They've developed over time in small, isolated regions for specific reasons. In Laos, our beds are arranged perpendicular to the center ridgepole of the house, unless you're a child with a house next to your parents. Then your head is going to be towards the parents' feet as a sign of obedience. And sure, these are kind of like facts that you're probably never going to remember, but how neat is that to go into a culture and figure out Wow, that's so cool that they have little parameters and interesting facts about them that make their culture unique as far as the ways where they place their head. You know, I love our culture here in the United States, but at the same time, it's like, hey, which way is your bed facing? And we're just like, ah, just whatever way we want. So on the one hand, that's really cool, whatever way we want. But on the other hand, it's like, well, what's unique about that? Well, it's, maybe it's unique because we can do whatever we want. But it's also cool to see these different parameters here of these cultures that are isolated. We finished it off with Thailand, who's got the Yuan and Shuan people who sleep with their heads all facing east, which is important to the Buddhists, and staircases must not face the west because that's the direction of death and evil spirits. Fun little tidbits to know about different cultures. U.S. housing. Well, we've talked about other cultures. What does it look like in the United States? U.S. folk housing is in three different areas. We've got New England, Middle Atlantic, and Lower Chesapeake tidewater. You will find the different diffusions of very similar types of folk housing in these three areas. Um, and we're not going to get in that today, 
but you need to know that because Rubenstein likes to question on that, and it definitely is good for understanding that there was three different distinct folk areas on the eastern seaboard of the east coast of the United States. As far as popular housing goes, there's definitely regional distinctiveness, but over time, that's diminished because everything starts to look the same and it's mass produced. So if we did have these certain parameters where you could look and go, go to this area and look at a house and like, oh, this house is different because it's got these gables and it's got a certain style of wood trim. As you move west, it really starts to become more difficult to discern what our folk traditional houses are because you can get timber and, and different materials all across the nation. Plus, people see an idea maybe that they, that they like from New England. They combine it with the Mid-Atlantic, and they build their house in Texas using both of those things. The main thing is, again, folk housing was built with a house and materials, what was used for one family. Now, with U.S. popular housing, they mass-produce houses. You go into a neighborhood, I think of my own suburban neighborhood here in the Dallas area, and I see houses that look exactly the same as mine. Not all over the place, but... My street, maybe I'm the house that looks like mine, and then a couple streets down, I see my exact house. Well, that's because they're mass producing these houses so they can efficiently and cheaply build them and it's get as much profit as possible. Houses after World War II, which was 1945, they become more modern style houses. Since the 1960s, they call them neo eclectic, eclectic meaning from many different sources. So houses are built with many different traditions and sources. Looking specifically, here's the graph. And you can see, and it's kind of cool, where you have the ranch-style houses, which were uh, early on after, at the onset of World War II and up to 1975, which consequently is when I was born. Yes, so at the production of this podcast, I'm 40 years old because it's 2016, but I haven't had my birthday yet, which is September of 2016, so I'm about to be 41. In any case, and you can look through these houses here uh, 1940s, 1980s, you got this contemporary style, what's more simplified, but as we move forward, we start to see the shed, and then people go back to the more traditional type houses, which, we, which you would have found on the East Coast, um, and they're pulling in things that make their house stand out, like you see these gables here, and the multiple uh, windows that are, have their own, um, sh their own roofs as well, and they go into neo-colonial and neo-Tudor. All we're looking for is the representation of folk housing in aspects of traditional housing. 